and homophobia in the Met. I also said to her that she was very clear in her report about her views about you, the Commissioner, and your deputy, and the confidence that she had in you. But I said, was she disappointed? I asked her, was she disappointed that you hadn't been able to accept the findings of institutionalised racism, sexism, misogyny and homophobia? And I just wanted to read to you what she said to me in response. She said, I think the Met Commissioner is unfortunately splitting hairs over words. She then went on to say, I feel it is a really missed opportunity. Deep into this, I just felt it is a shame. I hope that, over the next few weeks and months, as the Commissioner gets more into meeting Londoners and listening to what they have to say, he will not only accept my diagnosis, but accept what is not a label, but an accurate description of the organisation. I think he is letting his police down. I think he is letting his staff down. And I just wondered if you just want to comment on what Baroness Casey said and whether you've changed your mind after uh, the, week, the few weeks that have, have gone since the publication of the, the review. I, I, I keep reflecting, I keep thinking about this because I know um, it's a word that matters deeply um, uh, to some people in, in some quarters. Um, but I'm still at the moment of the same view. I've completely accepted the diagnosis that... Um, Louise lays out in her, in her report the fact that we have racism, misogyny, and homophobia in the organisation, the fact that it's not simply a few individuals, there are systemic and cultural failings in that, and the fact that it affects the experience of our people in the organisation and it affects the experience of, of the public in terms of policing. So I, I, fully, I fully accept those issues, and I was speaking out in very much the same terms from the moment I was appointed last September, well before her report, because I've been very clear that I came back to policing after nearly five years out because it's a moment for reform in policing and I want to be part of that because I care deeply about the public. The reason, uh, I know I've, in many ways I might have made life harder for myself, but the reason I'm not accepting it is it means so many different things to different people. Um, she set out very clearly well she, what the test is, the four, the four tests. Her, and, her, and I'm agreeing with her test, but yeah. her... Her definition, if you like, is different to the McPherson definition. It's different to some dic dictionary definitions. I've been asked at least three de different definitions in media interviews over the last, uh, last few weeks. Some of them mean nobody's a racist and it's just about system, all the way through to some of them mean um, most of the organisation are racist or misogynist. And that's the, sort of, that's the conundrum for me is I'm not going to put a label around my organisation which has so many different interpretations because every time I use it, I can't say... I'm using that word, and by that I mean this, 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 and not that, that, and that. So it, that's the reason I'm doing it. I don't you stand by. I mean, because that became the story, didn't it, at the time of the publication? It is. The story was you not accepting the, the definition of institutionalised. Baroness racism. Casey, we discussed it well before yeah. the publisher report. She knew my view. She knew those those issues, and she decided to make it the story. I just wondered, um, just on the, this issue. Uh, the, the national head of the Police Federation, I think Steve Hartsholm, had said that he did accept the, the definition within the Met of being institutional, racist, sexist and homophobic. He said it, it, it was necessary, and I think he did this in a personal capacity, but he said it was necessary to provide the leadership to recognise that. So what, what do you say about that? Steve's entitled to his own opinion. There aren't, there aren't different opinions. There are people um, at different levels in the Met who agree with me and some who, some who don't. And that's, this is a really tricky issue. I'm simply saying I'm not, as the Commissioner, going to put a label to my organisation that gets interpreted by many as meaning the majority of people are misogynist or racist or whatever. And that's, but none of this should, the, the focus should be what we're going to do about it because. So 25 years since McPherson, 30 years since um, the, awful, <coughs> the awful murder of, of Stephen Lawrence, lots of good people have tried hard to improve things. Home secretaries, police authorities, police and crime commissioners, mayors, commissioners, leaders across policing. And as you said yourself at the start, progress has been made, but clearly we have not collectively dug deep enough to make the difference need to be made and that's why this reform is required. Okay, well, well so you're, you're, you're standing by the position you took at the time of the publication. Okay, um, I just want to ask you a, a, another couple of questions before I move on to other colleagues. Um, 
this morning that the Home Secretary, I believe, is making a speech about a return to common sense policing at a back to basics think tank. Uh, I think she's assumed, claiming that the, the police, policing is too woke. At, at, at this time, we're obviously discussing the rather shock, the, the shocking findings of Baroness Case's um, report, and as we've just been talking about, the institutionalised racism, sexism, homophobia in the largest police force in the country. I just wondered if you could sort of explain to the committee how you managed to balance a common sense culture in policing where effective and robust operational policing is possible whilst also tackling those deep-seated institutional racism, sexism and homophobic problems and other prejudices that exist that we've seen that can undermine, clearly undermines, effective frontline policing. How do you do that? I'm not, I'm not sure I accept there's a tension, um, a tension between the two. <coughs> Officers are inherently um, practical in what they do. It's a, it's a very practical profession. And day in and day out, we've got officers going out across London um, <laughs> looking to make a difference, being, um, being practical, being determined, um, being courageous, um, supporting victims. I think one of the challenges that I see as part of our reform programme in the Met is um, an over-complexity of policy that sometimes slows officers down, um, a lack of equipment that Louis Casey calls out, something that we're already looking at is the, um, the way our frontline officers don't feel set up to succeed, they don't feel they've got the equipment, the resources, there are many examples in her report to that, to that effect. So I think there are lots of practical things we need to do to help officers succeed, some of that's buried in policy. Um, but I don't see a tension about I don't know, common sense meets success, I don't see a problem at all. Right. So do you think the police are too woke? No. No? You don't think that at all? Okay. And I just want to ask you this finally. As the most senior police officer in the country, would you ever allow concerns about being branded racist to prevent the sanctioning of police investigations into issues such as mm. um, grooming gangs? Uh, so, no. so without fear... So our cornerstone is without, without fear or favour. And... Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean we've always got that right, mm. but that's absolutely what we stand for, and we should be prepared to go after anybody, regardless of sort of mm. um, their position, regardless of um, a position of power, regardless of race, faith, um, uh, creed, anything at all. It shouldn't make any difference at all. And I think the uh. vast majority of time in policing, it hasn't done. Occasionally, there may be examples where we've slipped up in that regard, but it shouldn't be a factor. Okay, thank you very much. James Daly. Thank you very much, Chair. So, Mark, I am staggered by what you've just said, genuinely. Um, that I tell you a label for Metropolitan Police, and certainly it's management, and this is the nice version, is incompetent, and that's the nice version of it. The idea that you've had a string of good people coming in who've been working hard, well, every single one of them has failed, because the situation that you find yourself in in this organisation is a national disgrace. And without being open and saying that we are at a, at a stage where this organisation is just not functioning, and one example of that is, can you tell me how many people, police officers accused of domestic or sexual violence are currently serving on, fr in, on the front line of the Metropolitan Police? There's two, diff there's two different parts there. Um, I need to challenge you on the first point you've made. The first point is suggesting that um, the whole organisation, everybody in it, is rotten. I think what we need to be talking about... Uh, so, so, well, that, that's just not accurate, is it? And... What we have to do now, we need a serious conversation about re police reform. I mean, a serious conversation about police reform. If that becomes pillory of the good majority of people, that won't help anybody. There are big challenges. Leadership, um, there are leadership failings, definitely. There are hundreds of people in the organisation who shouldn't be there. There are all those problems I completely accept. But if, if our debate about police reform and police priorities becomes one of pillorying everybody, well, that doesn't serve the public. Yeah, well, that's just, you know, we, 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 it's time that politicians called out organisation management, the management of organisations like yours, for what it is, a complete and utter mess. It's been a complete and utter mess for a long time. And senior police officers must have turned a blind eye to what was going on, because the same issues that we are dealing with here today, we could have been asking you questions 10 years ago. So can I ask you, how many police officers who have been convicted or under investigation for sexual or domestic violence offending are serving in front, a frontline capacity today. 
I'm not going to um, pluck an exact number out of the air. We're, we're doubling, we're biggest doubling down on standards in policing for 50 years. Uh, we have um, we've more than doubled the numbers being sacked. Um, we, are, um, uh, we have far more officers suspended. We've got far more cases going to gross misconduct hearings. We're looking at a different way of doing vetting procedures to help us remove people from the organisation who aren't, aren't fit for purpose. Um, I've been uh, asking the Home Secretary and they're doing a review for powers that make it easy to deal with misconduct. We're doing an awful lot about this. We have done reviews looking back and we've got data which has been put in the public domain about the number of officers where we have had allegations of sexual offending or uh, domestic abuse. And those I'm just cases asking you, you're the Commissioner, today how many officers who have been committed, convicted you can of those matters are serving in frontline positions? You can pick a hundred questions with different numbers that I'm not going to answer here today. I can come back on detailed numbers afterwards. But I thought you would know that, Sir Mark. Isn't that a basic thing that you would be concerned that officers who are guilty of sexual offending, you are sending them out to deal with the most vulnerable situations? And that doesn't seem to bother anybody in the organisation. No, I'm not, not saying that's not true at all. Well, we're, we're, so tell me the number and tell me what you're doing about it then. I, I'm not going to pluck a, a number out there. We've been really clear. We've done Operation Onyx, which is a review of all those who've had allegations. Those allegations have been previously investigated and um, found to have um, no case to answer. We're concerned about history because mistakes have been made. There's about 1,130 um, cases in that. Um, a, a little shy of 250 of them um, we found no problem in. Um, a little shy of 200 of them um, we've got concerns about and are going into a vetting review process. And the other 600 or so are... Um, there are missed lines of inquiry or new lines of inquiry that have been followed through on. So we are doubling down on these standards issues, but I'm, um, I'm not going to accept pillory of the majority of people in the organisation. That's not, you're just making an excuse. I'm asking you specific, no, I'm I'm, I'm I'm asking you specific questions about the problems that are leading to people being treated in the most appalling manner. And just simply coming here and saying, I'm not going to answer this because it, it, it tars everybody. That's not the point. There's lots of good police officers in the Metropolitan Police. Those good police officers have been let down by your predecessors and senior management of the, of the, of the police. You were, you, before you came back, you served in a senior position in the Metropolitan Police. You must have seen, and that was about 2018, you must have seen these problems at that stage. I can't find any statements from you, Sir Mark, back in 2018 when you were a Deputy Commissioner, saying it's outrageous that we've got police officers that, are, uh, that shouldn't be serving in the organisation. And you seem to be typical of, an, of, of, of a senior police officer at the Metropolitan <laughs> Police who's just gone along with this, gone along with this negligence, this incompetence, turned a blind eye, and that's why we're here today. And I have real concerns about that. We have made much progress over the last few decades, as the Chair said at the start, but it is not enough and we are doubling down on standards more ferocious than has been done for five decades. We're removing people faster and we're tackling these issues. But the vast majority of our people are good people and the debate which turns this into um, pillory of the police, root and branch, is is not something I'm going to accept because we have men and women going out there today determined to protect Londoners, being brave, being compassionate, and they need, they need your support as much as they need my support whilst we tackle the fundamental systemic issues which have let them down and let the public down. If somebody is, uh, final two questions, um, if somebody's convicted, if a Metropolitan Police officer is convicted of a criminal offence or is found there is sufficient evidence to find that sexual um, or sexual violence or sexually inappropriate behaviour has been undertaken by the officer. Are, do you, is there a process and do you agree that you should sack them on the spot? Um, I'd love to have the power to do so. You do have the power to do that? That's not true. So most police misconduct is dealt with by independent lawyers. I do not have the last say who is a police officer. So we have people who have been sacked by senior police officers and then reinstated by independent legally qualified chairs and at the either in the, uh, or police appeals tribunals, who put them back in the organisation. There is a complex system where I don't have the final say who's in the organisation. That's one of the changes I've asked for. We also have police regulations which have no explicit power to remove an officer who fails vetting. Commissioners have been lobbying for this for over 20 years and politicians haven't been prepared to move the rules. Well, I, again... I don't accept that for a second. You're the only organisation in the country. It's true. It's a well, fact. No, you're the only organisation, therefore, Sir Mark, in the country who um, can quite happily, well, not happily, can quite um, can tolerate people who've indulged in behaviour of the most serious... Um, I'm not tolerating it at all. 
Well, they're still serving in your organisation, and they're I'm still not on tolerating the front line today. So, but you're, you are telling us, not tolerating you are at telling all. us um, today that those people whose, whose behaviour matches that, that you, whatever the, the process that comes after it, that you and your organisation will sack them immediately if they're convicted of a criminal offence or they are found guilty of sexual, uh, or sexually inappropriate behaviour or domestic violence. Of course. That, that's, that, that's, they will that's, immediately be sacked by you. Um, that's illegal. I'm not allowed to sack them myself. That's so it's misconduct. Yes, but misconduct processes aren't in the hands of police chiefs. They are in the hands of independent, legally qualified chairs. That's one of the changes in the rules I'm asking for. So I will do everything I can to remove them from the organisation, but it's not always my decision. And we've got many cases where they've been reinstated out with of our power. Okay. So, but okay. my intention is absolutely to do that. Right. And have you had any indication from the Home Secretary when she's likely to make any announcement about changes to misconduct? Um, I'm expecting it in the next few weeks. It's, it's within a few weeks. Within a few weeks? Yes. Thank you. Simon Fell. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Mark for joining thank you. us. Um, Operation Onyx, you, you, yes. you rattled through some figures um, when talking to my, my colleague a few uh, minutes ago. Could you uh, just update us where you are on this in terms of the, the review, which I, I think was due to close at the end of last month, mm -hmm. um, where you are in terms of officers facing dismissal and those facing criminal investigation as well? So, um, just to recap, if you look at cases like Cousins and Carrick, you see that there are missed opportunities to deal with to some of the most awful individuals. Um, because of that, I ordered a review of mm. 10 years of data. So 10 years of cases where allegations have been made against um, officers that are either um, uh, of, of sexual misconduct, of sexual criminality or, or, or domestic abuse. Every one of those individuals, so that identified 1,100 and I can find the numbers in a minute if you want, but 1,100 and something individuals, it's in the public domain in a letter I wrote to Home Secretary and there, just over 1,100 individuals. Um, we didn't just look at those cases, we looked at those individuals in the rounds, so um, beyond those cases. And this was a, a first stage of sort of triage and review process. I think there were 13 data sets um, and a, a, an awful lot of analysis and research and reviewing evidence done. As I say, sort of uh, around 250 were found to ha have no problems. Um, there was a, another sort of 600 odd where either the investigators felt there were missed investigative opportunities on the original cases, so need to have a fresh look at that, or because of taking a wider look at that individual, there were new investigative lines of inquiry. So there were over 600 where we wanted to look further. Um, and that work is now happening. And then there were um, a, a just shy of 200 where there were um, some residual concerns and we were putting them into a sort of a vetting review process. So we went through that, that process and now those next stages of work are, are taking place. I know these numbers are deeply concerning. One of the things we're doing differently is we're bringing outside experts in. So we've got um, sort of experts from different um, uh, uh, sexual abuse sort of charities and um, and domestic abuse charities and victim support organisations, etc. And so they're looking over our shoulders. So all these decisions. So we're re-looking at this with a fresh pair of eyes and a more assertive approach, and also asking others to sort of make sure that we're marking the homework sort of appropriately, so to speak. So I'm, I'm sure that we'll be moving many, we'll be reinstate, doing fresh investigations or removing officers for vetting failures in many of these cases, and that's what we're working through at the moment. Thank, thank you, and, and you're right, that those are large numbers and they yeah. will be of concern. Do you have a time frame for, for the um, 600 individuals you're taking a fresh look at and the 200 issue you have <sighs> genuine concerns about how long that process it's, is going to take? It's going to take several months to work through all those cases and all those investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, because, we've, because we've shaken the tree so vigorously, we've got more reports coming in a misconduct, we've got more officers standing up and mm -hmm. saying, I'm worried about um, X or Y. Um, we've, so we've got more of that coming in. So I, we've got two things that I'm feeling. One is this, what I might call legacy cases, where we're looking back and saying, actually, we know we've made mistakes in history, when our misconduct process haven't been strong enough. We look back at key issues and we will find problems that were missed and we've got to deal with those individuals. Secondly, 
we're shaking the tree, we're getting more allegations from officers, more allegations from the public, which is positive, and that's generating a bigger caseload going forward. And so balancing those two caseloads is challenging. We've put sort of over 200 new officers into that environment, and on short-term measures recently, as I've said publicly, we've been um, uh, uh, tasking officers to support them from um, counter-terrorism and specialist crime commands, and that's been helping greatly. And what I've been encouraged by is the number of officers volunteering to help out because the vast majority get this is is so critical for, for us and they want to make a difference. Thank you. And, and, and while this investigation is going on, what's the status of those individuals who are being looked at? Do they still have warrant cards? Are they still um, the, serving? So the majority of them do because they've been investigated in the past, found to have no case to answer, and now we're picking over those cases again. As soon as we find something of deep concern, their status will be reviewed. They might be restricted or suspended. Are they restricted in what they're doing at the moment? So, so if there's not a, if there's not a historic the majority concern of them, around some sort of sexual assault or something like that, they, they can still work on cases like that? So these are, I, I divide this into two things. So a, a fresh allegation of domestic abuse that has been investigated criminally is likely to lead to a restriction or probably a suspension. Cases which have been historically dealt with and closed and no, um, no fault been found in that initial investigation, we're re-looking re at those. If any of those get to a stage where we decide actually we're seriously concerned about this officer, then clearly restriction or suspension is likely again. And, yeah, one of Baroness and Just to give a sense of so this, the, the, just to give why these cases aren't all straightforward and why um, some aren't concerning. So within these cases, you will have, for example, um, uh, someone um, suffering mental health crisis who's been in police custody who alleges everyone in custody raped her and um, has been sectioned shortly afterwards and the whole of the custody block is videoed and so, so the, the, the evidence that there's no concern here, it's just a sad, sad case, is very powerful. So you get a range from the sort of sad and malicious to the deeply worrying and sifting through that is not always straightforward but that's what we're doing. And, and I appreciate that but one of the issues that Baroness Casey raised was um, obviously public perception and, and the concern there, but also you know, in, her, in her words, whether the Met is able to police itself. Um, so for those sort of 250 which are, would fall into that bracket you've just described, you know, what sort of external check is there, there to, to reassure the public that actually you. You know, your dismissal of them is robust? <laughs> and that the public does can have confidence in these officers. That's why we've got this independent um, advisory group and they're looking through all these cases and, and sort of, say, double-checking our thinking. And so uh, I'll be... That will provide us with confidence. It will provide us with that sort of third eye, which is really helpful, saying, well, I think this is what it looks like, but maybe that's sort of a blinkered view and you've got somebody else providing that. But also it provides it for the public in terms of independent experts have looked at these cases and said, yeah, well, we agree with the police decision on that. So that's what... That they're, then those independent experts are working through those cases at the moment. Thank you. And, and last question from me, uh, Chair. And one of Baroness Casey's other um, findings, which was very powerful when she was in front of us, was essentially reform or die. Mm. So if you don't get this right, if you don't land this right, then you know, the Met should not exist in, it, in its current form. I'd be very keen to hear your thoughts on, on that and what an answer to that might look like if, <coughs> if you can't land this process properly and if you can't regain the, the public the public's confidence. We will succeed in reform. But you might say that. <laughs> Why when? This is not an overnight issue. If you look at, this is, this is several years' work, but you will see progress quarter by quarter. Uh, that, that, that's what I absolutely promise. If you look at big organisations in any sector that get into a situation where they're heading in the wrong direction, there is never a sort of silver bullet solution to it. You have to come up with the right, the right plan, which with a big organisation, there's going to be multiple parts to that, and we can talk about our turnaround plan that we published and the work we're doing to reform. You have to come up with a, the, the right plan, and then it just comes down to relentless delivery, step by step improving. There is and sort of any big organisations um, that reach for some creative um, silver bullet solution. It never works. I think we'll have some questions about how we will be able to monitor that, of that course. progress. Yeah. 
Um, can I just <coughs> ask you a few things? One is, have you got any serving police officers at the moment who have criminal convictions? Yes. And what are you doing about that? I think the public would be shocked to know that a serving police officer has a criminal yeah. conviction. I, so, I think if we can make it not completely binary, I think there'll be a small number of cases which people would, none of us would be worried about. So someone who at 14 gets a caution for something very, very minor, and at 28, having had a work history, etc., joins the police. I don't, I don't think people would be concerned about some of those cases. But serious crime um, or, and or crime committed as a police officer, that, 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 that has no place in policing. Absolutely agree with you completely. Um, we have um, too many cases where, um, where that is true. Um, How many police officers do you have who've had a conviction whilst they've been a serving police officer? Um, those numbers are in the letter that we put publicly to the Mayor and the Home Secretary, and I, I can't pull it out the back of my head, I can't remember it, but we, I, I, that number's in the public domain. So we have too many of them, and um, they have been... Are they been suspended from duty, or are they, what are they, what's happened to them? Um, so this is where, this is why I want legal change to the current regulation, so... What has happened to them today? What, what, what are they doing today? So if I talk through the yeah. process, so <coughs> they get investigated, so they... They've gone, to, they've gone to court, they've got a criminal conviction. Um, they then go to a misconduct panel, yeah. um, which... No, I understand all that. I'm just wondering and, and, today, and are they serving officers with a warrant card doing so, so, so then they're, facing duties? Then they're reinstated, often against, sort of often against our, uh, our will. We've then got a police officer who we don't think should be a police officer who we've got some concerns about. So we put restrictions on them. So we have to have them in the workplace because that's the decision. So depending on what the conviction's for, we might have restrictions on them. So we have officers, we have officers in the organisation who are restricted um, from, for example, getting involved in um, evidence or officers um, restricted from um, having public contact. It's completely ridiculous. OK. So the letter that you wrote to the <laughs> Mayor and the Home Secretary, that's... Uh, available to the public? It was pub yeah, publicised that two or three weeks ago. So that has the numbers in it? It has the numbers in it, yeah. Right, and that's the le letter of the 3rd of April? Yes, that's the one, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll bring in Karen Harris. Then I've got one more question, then I'm going to go to uh, Lee Anderson. Very quickly, Sir Mark. Oh, there. If, if you are a, a dinner lady or a school governor <coughs> or you want to work with uh, certain vulnerable people, you have to have a DPS check on a regular basis. If you are a police officer and you fail a DPS check, how can it be justified that you remain in post? Um, I agree with you. So we have a we are under different employment law to most people. So there's something called police regulations, as opposed to normal employment law. And police regulations prescribe the, all the processes for um, for for misconduct, for unsatisfactory performance, and they are um, complex and. Um, uh, Byzantine and I don't think they're right at all um, and that's why I've been asking for reform of them and that, so that creates these these issues where very simple issues under normal employment law you'd be saying goodbye to somebody um, become quite complex issues in policing and often don't produce that result and it's not acceptable I say and, and sort of um, commissioners have been asking for change in this for over 20 years but um, those lobbying to keep these sort of rules have, have won. So that's why I'm asking for it. Thank you, Mark. I'm just looking at the letter, and it, it does say that 161 police officers in the Met have a criminal conviction. Yeah. And I think it also says that the majority, 70% of the 161, had a conviction uh, before they became an officer. But it then goes on to say that um, eight officers committed their offence whilst in the Met and remain serving and a further 49 officers have convictions for crimes of dishonesty or violence. <coughs> oh, is that possible? It's unacceptable, isn't it? I think that's quite shocking, actually. I agree. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Right, OK. That, I sort of, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not defending the vast... <laughs> there's a small number of people who you would say, if it's yeah. in that minor, historic, young people box, but the majority of it is completely unacceptable. Yeah, and I think, actually, we, we heard about the case of the police officer who was masturbating on a train... Got a, got a conviction, and as I understand it, is still serving in the Metropolitan Police today. Yeah, those, there's many cases, not the many, there's, there's tens of cases that are completely unacceptable. It's disgraceful. Just before I come to Lee Anderson, excuse me, I just wanted to ask you, the uplift data uh, figures have been published. Um, One Force, the Metropolitan Police Service, did not meet its total uplift allocation. 
the force missed its allocation of 4,557 additional officers by 1,089. That's 23.9%. What do you say about that? That was obviously a government priority, wasn't it, to get the, the uplift figure up to 20,000? Yeah, so we are 1,000 officers light of our target. Um, I wish we'd hit it, but we, we haven't. Why haven't you? Um, so I think there are a range of, there are a range of factors in this. I mean, we've re we have recruited over the last three years more than 9,000 officers, uh, which is um, the most, I think, ever in such a short period. Um, we, haven't hit the, we haven't hit the target. Obviously, we are striving to maintain the quality. That's really important. I think there are factors which include both, I think the, sort of the reputation of the organisation at the moment doesn't help recruiting, um, but also um, the employment market and the pay situation is really challenging. So the employment market in London, as you all know, is very, very hot and very difficult. And um, officer pay points, frontline officer pay points have gone down 17% in real terms in a decade. So we're um, uh, paying people um, less um, new recruits less in, a, in a, the hottest in part of the employment market in the country. So I think that's a factor as well. And I hope that um, PRRB and this year's settlement goes some way towards redressing that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for answering that question. Uh, Lee Anderson. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Commissioner, for coming thank and you. taking his questions. Um, I'd like you to tell the committee, please, um, give examples of cases of racism, mis misogynism and sexism which you've personally witnessed while serving as a police officer, and what did you do about it? I, I, have, I have always been tough on standards in the organisation. I didn't ask that. I said, give me examples of sexism, racism, and misogynistic behaviour that you've actually witnessed whilst being a police officer. I can't remember any immediately. You I can't remember any? No, I can't. Well, I, I find that very difficult to believe. I think everybody watching this would find that difficult to believe that you're in charge of cleaning up the, the Met Force, really, it's your, it's your responsibility, but you can't actually remember any. Do you, do you seriously expect uh, the committee to believe that? So I, as a senior officer, I have sat on many misconduct panels. <coughs> I've pretty much dismissed everybody who's come in front of me on those panels. <coughs> I've always been very tough on that. Yes, what you'd actually witness yourself. I find it pretty hard to believe that a police officer with, with you know, years and years of service with an organisation has not witnessed any of this when we know it goes off. Because if you have, you must have been walking around with your eyes closed. So, there are many officers in the organisation. So, when you look at the, um, say, the case report and all these issues, there are officers in the organisation who are um, angry and upset because they recognise this and they've had these experiences. There are officers who haven't seen it and don't recognise it. People have different experiences in the organisation. Have you actually witnessed it, racism, sexism? I, I've seen nothing like that in the Met, no. But I've, I've, I've only worked in the Met for six years as a very senior officer. Mm. It doesn't come across your desk in that way. Have you seen about it in, in the time you've been in the police? I'm, I'm not going to try and test my memory to go back to the 1980s. Right, OK. I think that sort of answers my question. I think you're... It would appear that you're in denial. That um, not in denial at all. It. I've been more forthright about the need to reform and the need to confront standards in policing right. than any commissioner for decades. I would imagine that anybody else in any any other industry has witnessed this type of behaviour and would admit to it and say, yes, it does it does exist. It has happened. I have witnessed it. I think you're probably the only person I've ever met that would say they can't remember. I, I'm not going to get into a case by case discussion. I'm just one I, case then. Just one case. No, no, I'm going to case by case discussion. I'm. I'm absolutely determined to tackle the issues in the organisation. I've always been tough on standards and I'll continue to be. We are going to reform the issues that need tackling. I need the support of politicians in dealing with this. I need the regulations to change and I need the help to, to build well, on the, the work. The support of politicians, Commissioner, you've got to be honest. And to sit there and say you, 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 you can't remember that when you've witnessed the, these incidents, I don't think that's very honest at all. People don't misbehave in front of senior officers in that way. That's, that's an unrealistic have question. Have always been a senior officer? Of course I haven't. I sort of well, joined policing in 1987. Did you witness any? Yeah. The behaviour in the 80s and 90s was very different to today. Of course it was. Yeah, did you witness it? Of course I've seen things that sort of weren't, weren't fit for today's standards, but I'm not going to get into detail about that. Okay. Today we're about reforming policing and we need the support of politicians to do that, to help us with the right regulations. We've already doubled down on standards, as I said. We're sacking officers at twice the rate. <laughs> We're having the biggest look at professional standards that has been done in 50 years. And that is a sign of our absolute commitment. We started that from day one of my time as commissioner. 
and um, I'm you know, grateful the Home Secretary is looking to help us by changing the regulations. Yeah, well, I think you want to wriggle on after that one, Commissioner. I'll, um, I'll, I'll try another question. We've seen protesters again, once again, in, in Parliament Square setting up some sort of Glastonbury on Thames, on Thames gazebo with uh, some pretty poor artists, if, 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 if uh, memory serves me right. Um, so do you agree with the, the recommendations, I think it was by the, the, the policy, policy exchange, that there should be zero tolerance to these sort of events? Um, and we shouldn't be putting up with antisocial behaviour. And just this morning, we've seen protesters on Whitehall around Parliament Square, probably as you was coming into the building. Don't you think it's time that you left the Ivory Tower and got out there on Whitehall and sorted these people out? Because, you know, people of London, the tourists, the, the people that work at this place, and the, you know, the taxi drivers, the bus drivers, they're getting fed up of it, and you're just letting it happen. You've got the powers now to do this. So... Um, there's current bill bouncing around Parliament which hasn't come in yet, so those powers aren't in existence yet. Um, it's, so not, it's not strictly true, is it? You, get, you can move these people on. They're, they're obstructing the highway. So we could have a, a long conversation about public order law. So no, but, why well, not moving them on? Well, because you're... I don't want a long conversation. You're, 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 making, you're making selective um, comments based on a partial understanding of the law. I do not want Londoners disrupted... Um, any more than anybody else does, but the law is very clear that protest is disruptive, and to a reason, and to a certain extent, that is allowed. That is what the law says at the moment. Now, you might not like that, but I have to work the law rather than um, not right. rather than whim. Now, it is it is right. It's not, Commissioner. But it's not. It's so, the... so, so, it's you might want to believe that the law says that no disruption is allowed whatsoever through protest, but that is not the case. I think you might want to believe, Commissioner, that you, you know that you're doing your job correctly. And we, I don't think you are. But I'm just going to ask one more question. I'll make one more statement because I, I feel like I'm wasting my time with you, to be honest. Um, you say you took five years out of, of yeah. the force. There's probably people listening to this today wish it was a lot longer, uh, and I'm one of them. Um, do you think you've got the competence of the public? I'm not going to sit here. When, if people want to be personally offensive, then write it in newspapers, but I'm not going to answer those questions. OK, I don't, I don't think we want to be personally offensive. I think we're trying to get to what the problems are in the Met and how you're going to tackle them. Can I just ask a question about the, the issue of the protest? Is, is because of what's happening out in, in Parliament Square? The, is that the reason why we saw this week, I think it was the Prime Minister being driven down uh, Whitehall with a sort of a whole number of police officers on bicycles and then a whole number of police officers running alongside the, the like entourage? Korea, is, that, is that now how North policing Korea, has to protect the Prime Minister because of the protests out in Parliament Square? So there was a large protest, pr planned protest in Parliament Square um, uh, the, parliament, uh, the Prime Minister was returning to um, his office for some urgent business, and so um, we dealt with those two conflicting pressures to get the par um, Prime Minister back into his office. I've never seen so many police officers on bicycles and running at great speed trying to keep up with a, a car. I mean, it's rather reminiscent of the American president and the way they operate. Anyway. We'll move on to Carolyn Harris. You, you won't often see no. the, um, a protected person being taken through a large protest, but on that occasion it was necessary, so that's why you saw some unusual tactics. So that was a one-off? We're not going to see that? That's not the routine, though. No, OK. Thank God for that. Those officers looked a bit out of puff, actually, as they were running <laughs> down the... Fitness test. Yeah, happened down happened. Whitehall. <laughs> OK. Right, Carolyn Harris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Mark, Baroness Casey um, pointed to the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Service as being particularly bad, if we're honest. Yes. Um, why is that? Ready now. Ready. So, I think there's a, there's a range of reasons in there. Uh, the, she also pointed, frankly, she pointed out that there's, there are cultural challenges across our firearms commands. It wasn't just about parliamentary diplomatic protection. So I think parliamentary diplomatic protection, there's a range of things we need to do. Um, we, so we've changed the leadership. We are, um, a third of the sergeants have changed recently. It's an unusual role. I mean, you see that sort of around here, sort of static protection. It doesn't appeal, hasn't appealed historically to that many officers. So I think we've had a very static workforce, which hasn't helped. Um, the working arrangements have been designed over the years in a way which has um, reduced the ability of supervisors to supervise because the way people are on post and the way it's been funded and organised and some of the facilities they operate in hasn't helped. So there's, a, there's been a range of factors which have created a unit which looks and works very different to other policing units and um, some bad cultures have 
got to hold there, and that's not acceptable. Yeah, I think it, I think it's being termed by some police officers operate as as an overtime operation, and that it's attracted police officers who may want to carry a gun. Is there is there no um, accountability then on those who may have been in charge of that particular unit, is it the management and, and the senior personnel in, in bringing order into that unit? One of the challenges for um, the overtime issue, for example, um, these aren't all for lack of, lack of trying. So we struggle to recruit as many firearms officers in London as we need, um, firearms, so across the different commands, and that means that in, in not just that operation, but other operations, we have um, officers doing a lot of overtime to cover posts that we couldn't recruit people into. So um, some of those things don't come out of mismanagement, they come out of management def trying to stretch a limited amount of resources to cover more posts than are ideal. So it's, some of those issues are, um, are part of it. Of course, if we find individuals who knew about bad behaviour and tackle, didn't tackle it, of course we'll tackle them as well. Did you not have responsibility for this unit at one point? Oh, so, um, when I was responsible for the national approach to counter-terrorism, um, the protection commands were part of my responsibilities. So I had sort of um, the national lead for fighting counter-terrorism, um, so sort of ten thousand people across the country in different roles, including the d protection commands. Yes. But given that that unit has access to um, some of the most important people in the country and some of the most important visitors to the country, <coughs> isn't it even more important that they are highly scrutinised and that you are, we, or you and we can have confidence that we're not exposing people to people who may be not behaving in an acceptable manner? I completely agree with that. I think this is, so what all of these reviews show is that the, um, the vetting standards, the way we've done professional standards investigations, those issues that we are tackling now, those systems that we've all relied on, haven't been as strong as they need to be, and that's caused these problems. Completely agree with you. Yeah, so Operation 11 is going to be uh, doing a root and branch investigation into this. It seems really strange to me that one of the, what should be one of the most <coughs> respected services in the United <coughs> Kingdom, at this state and stage, needs to be having a root and branch investigation into how its, um, its officers are working. You know, we should be respecting the police, not expecting them to investigate themselves. How is the operation coming along? So um, that operation is all about, say, starting the changes in parliamentary diplomatic protection. So, so the, the senior leadership team has all changed. A third of the sergeants have changed. Um, we have, uh, we're doing a different recruiting approaches to get younger officers, a different mix of officers, more diverse mix of officers in. And you start to see those changes coming through around you in parliament. So, it's making progress, but I think across our firearms commands, as, as Louise Casey points out, there's some more fundamental reforms that, um, that are required. Um, we're looking to get a sort of senior officer in with, who's not spent time in the Met to sort of help lead that work, and, um, and that will develop over the next year. Yeah, I, I get the sense that Louise Casey was actually saying it needs to be completely disbanded and start all over again. Would you agree with that? Um, she used the phrase, um, effectively disband, um, she absolutely understands that we can't disband it overnight because Parliament and, and um, Downing Street and embassies need protecting. So we need to create as much churn in this as possible, change how it works, change how it supervises, change how all the firearms commands work. But um, disbanding something doesn't work if you've got a job to do tomorrow. Yeah, but, but Sir Mark, how confident are you? I mean, I, I completely understand that all those organisations and people that you, we, we need to protect should be protected. Yes. But are we actually protecting them by exposing them to people that, w that a review that you yourselves are conducting into their behaviour would indicate that they're not the kind of people that we should have in the job in the first place? So, I think we shouldn't use it in the general term. That doesn't mean they're not all the kind of people we should have in the job. There's no, lots no, of, not the, all. The, of course, there's lots of good people there. That's why the big approach on professional standards, um, the, the tougher approach on vetting, the investigations we're doing, the reviewing old cases, all of that work is happening so that across the mess, including in these specialist areas, we can get rid of the people who shouldn't be here. Thank you, Chair. Um, just before I come to Tim Lawton, I just want to ask you, um, you've, told, you've told the committee that you'd be swapping out at least eight of the top 14 uh, officer posts in the Met to create a leadership team yeah. that can succeed for the future. 
and I think you've, you've already started to do that. I just wanted to check with you, have you got similar plans for the Met's senior civilian leadership team? There's been some stories about some of the people who've been in the Met for a long time in civilian posts and staff posts who are still there. I just wondered, are you, are you managing to change those people as well or are you just carrying on with the people who were there before? So the, we've got several senior posts being advertised at the moment. So, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of change taking place at senior levels. Your plan is to overhaul the, the staff roles as well as the officer roles? So um, we, we have... Um, two board level posts open for advert at the moment um, and several posts at the level below that and you feel confident. and they're going outside so so we will take the best person sometimes the best person might come from inside sometimes from outside but a large proportion will definitely come from outside and just remind me do you have any independent scrutiny of, of when you're appointing people do you have independent people who are not part of the Met on your selection board um, so for the most senior posts yes we um, sometimes involve um, at City Hall, and um, we've got um, non-executive directors, independent people on our board who help us with some of these processes as well. So for the most senior posts, we always have somebody different there. And that's for the staff posts as well? Yes. Yes, OK, thank you. Tim Lawton. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Mark, can I be le less diplomatic than uh, Mr Anderson? When I came in this morning, there were 10 police officers shadowing 10 rather shabby-looking eco-terrorists with their banners bringing the whole of the traffic around Parliament Square to a standstill. When we asked you about this subject in a previous uh, hearing, you acknowledged that the terms of the Traffic Act 1980, whatever it uh, was, would apply to anybody who was obstructing the highway and not allowing people going about their legitimate business. Those protesters were in breach of that act. Why were they not stopped or moved to another place on a very wide pavement that's available around uh, Parliament where they could have held their protest peacefully without disrupting people trying to go about their business? So that's not an accurate reflection of what I said when I was here before. We, we have to allow some highway obstruction before it becomes so unreasonable to be able to intervene because of people's rights to protest. That's the legal framework created. I'm not saying that's right or wrong in terms of that's how it should be, but that's how it is. And so what officers are always balancing is um, allowing a reasonable amount of protest, but not allowing it to become seriously, seriously disruptive. There is no definition in law of serious disruption. Parliament is currently working on that, and I think there's been a, the, the bill has been doing ping pong between um, the Lords and the Commons on that. That clarity that that definition will bring will make it easier for us to intervene. They clearly obstructed the highway. That is under the existing law of the Highways Act. There was an alternative for them to carry on their protest statically or even marching slowly up and down the pavement, which the police could have redirected them to. That would not have been unreasonable unless they had permission to bring Parliament Square to a standstill. And as we speak, I gather they're doing a similar exercise up and down uh, Whitehall. They have broken the law you have not arrested them or moved them on. That's incorrect. As I've said, it's not simply about the breach of the obstruction of the highway. There is plenty of case law that says that is permitted for protest and we are having to, we are having to work in a very uncertain legal framework, which is why I'm grateful that um, the Prime Minister and Home Secretary have responded to our ask and there's an act going through Parliament at the moment trying to define serious disruption because that's what we have to wrestle with. It's, it's not as straightforward as saying you can immediately arrest somebody for obstructing the highway if they're protesting. Okay, I, I'm not even suggesting you arrest them, I'm suggesting we'll move you, them on. You, okay. gen you gently nudge them towards a very convenient pavement space which would not cause inconvenience to the public and our constituents. I see we're not going to agree on how we define existing legislation if the new legislation going through Parliament now does become law in anything like its current form. Would that protest this morning not therefore have happened? I'd need to see it, but I think it's a lot. Uh, so I haven't seen the detail that you, the, the video perhaps you've seen, but I think it's less like, from your description of it, it's a lot less likely it would, ha it would be legal. What would you have done? So there, were, there are 10 dis demonstrators with their banners across several highways of Parliament Square walking so very, very slowly, so no traffic could pass except for bicycles. 
So that is disrupting the traffic and people going about their, their business. It's very clear. You know what the new legislation uh, is going to, uh, to say. Surely, under the new legislation, the, the minute they got their banners out and stood in the middle of the road, you would have moved them on or arrested them if they refused to be moved on. Yes? Under the new legislation, which I think talks about um, serious disruption being anything that causes more than a minor inconvenience to others, then that would seem to be in breach and therefore it would lead to a police intervention. OK, I think seem, seems to is, yeah, is well, a so bit worrying, given that this is quite controversial new legislation to deal with precisely this sort of thing. However, let's get back to the case in hand. It brings me to the subject of public confidence. And if the public can't have confidence that you know how to use new laws, which are very clearly intended to stop demonstrations um, causing havoc to ordinary uh, law-abiding uh, taxpayers this morning, then it's not surprising, whilst the public is rapidly losing confidence in police generally and in the Met particularly. Now, yesterday we had the minister here with officials from the Home Office on this subject. We were talking about the Met, and apparently you are now required to write a weekly letter to the Home Secretary on the progress you're making to restore... I'm not, I'm not required. We do that routinely. It's not a requirement. You have offered to, to, to yes. do that. And that's so the Dear Sweller letter, which is weekly winging its way to the Home Office. Is there any problem with that letter being made public? It's very operationally sensitive. It's got a lot of current cases in it, so yes, there is a problem with that. Do you think you should do a version which uh, could be made uh, public so it gives some confidence to the public that you're taking your mission seriously and are making progress or not? I think there's lots of ways we do public communication. I think doing a weekly letter to London is probably not a way I would choose to do it, but we will do regular public updates on big issues. We have lots of releases going out through the media um, where the big themes like the update on misconduct and standards that letter was publicized on the 3rd or 4th of april so we will routinely put material out there to show the progress we're making but i'm not sure a weekly letter is the way i would do it so the mayor apparently is going to be holding regular interviews with uh, with you with um greater london um members mm -hmm. to again scrutinize this uh, progress uh, we're not sure what form they're going to take because they've not started yet would you be amenable to those taking place in public uh, it's a choice for the Mayor, but I'm relaxed about that. So you'll be very happy to be held accountable by the Mayor and London councillors in a public forum? Um, by the Mayor. So the, the law says I'm accountable to the Mayor because he's the Police and Crime Commissioner for London. Right, but in the term of these proposed venues, which you'll be appearing at regularly, you are perfectly comfortable if they're in the public forum? If, if that's what the Mayor seeks, that's fine. Fine, good. That will go in our report, hopefully, as a recommendation to the, to the Mayor. When we last visited Scotland Yard, we had a meeting with the professional standards um, managers, and they're obviously an important part mm. of delving through officers who have perhaps not been as closely scrutinised in the past as they should have been about remaining as uh, serving officers, which is, um, uh, is, is highly desirable. Um, unfortunately, we ran out of time at that meeting because the room was booked for some other important body within Scotland Yard, so we were turfed out, so we didn't quite have the time to finish our, our questioning. One of the areas where um, I certainly suggest there might be improvements is that at the moment you are moving more serving police officers into the professional standards boards to oversight, see the work uh, of the potential uh, misdemeanours of other police officers, i.e. police marking their own homework. Do you not think there is now an overriding case that the Professional Standards Board should consist of a number of very experienced people from bodies outside of the police to scrutinise the conduct of the police and the records that they're going through at the moment? So we're bringing in outside experts to, um, to oversee the work and to, to, to look at our work, and I think that's really important. Of course, we already have the most serious cases are dealt with by the Independent Office of Police Complaints. If we are going to reform the organisation, though, leaders need to have the ability to deal with the standards issues. And the more you take it out of the organisation, the harder you make it to be. One of the consequences of legally qualified chairs taking over misconduct panels from senior police officers over the last six or seven years is, how, is those independent lawyers sack fewer people. 
they um, so the further people are away from it, the more forgiving they are of the behaviour is what I've seen. So I want I want the powers to be able to deal with this. Yeah, I'm not talking about misconduct um, panels, and there are serious problems with the IOPC, as you know, as this committee has reported on, not least uh, its chief executive and joint chairman is currently under investigation and has left the post, so there's only an acting chief executive there uh, at the moment. What we suggested is that within those people who are overseeing investigations, who are directing how thorough those investigations should be, the sort of thresholds that investigations should meet before further action could then be uh, required against police officers, should contain an element of outside professionals from the army, for example, uh, who seem to be much better at rooting out uh, uh, people who are not appropriate for the, uh, for the army to be part of that department to advise. What's wrong with that? So I say we've got some independent advisors already helping us with some of our work. So I think having advisors is, external advisors is really helpful and we're doing more and more of that. They are consultants. They are not sitting alongside serving police officers, giving views, making judgments on how to take cases further uh, or not. It seems to me a box-ticking exercise. And if you seriously want to restore it's public confidence... It's not a box-ticking exercise at all. Well, effectively, that's what we were told when we went to see Scotland Yard, because they're not... They're not at a box-ticking the exercise. They are not at the top table. They are... They are having full access and looking at the decision making and advising on whether we're getting decision making right on some of the most tricky cases. So it is not box sticking, it is really substantial work. On a few individual high profile cases, you may have had some outside advice. You're looking at over a thousand officers or even, uh, yeah. even, even more. The thresholds on which they're um, judged, the criteria that now needs to be applied uh, to them, is being designed almost exclusively by serving police officers. Whereas the view of this committee and of our discussions, and I thought also the impression of some of the people who are in that department who sort of said, well, oh, that's a good idea, isn't it? Was that you would benefit from having a completely different perspective and a fresh set of eyes from people from other um, uh, agencies who have no flag or whatever for the, uh, uh, for, the, for the police can apply some of their own disciplines, which have worked quite well in other organisations and have singularly failed in the Met so far. I just don't see what the problem is with bringing them in at the top table properly, which they're not at the moment. So we're, I, I'm not sure I'm fully understanding the point. So we, we're bringing external advisors in. We're always open to recruiting people from outside the organisation. It may be something we'll adopt in the future. It's just not something I'm going to commit to now. At the moment, with a, a different legal framework to people in other walks of life, the fact you've got these police regulations, having people who are expert in that is quite important. And I think using the team we've got at the moment, enhanced uh, as it is, hopefully with new regulations, can make the bulk of the difference, as long as we have some of that external eye over some of our most critical decisions to make sure that we're not tipping it in the wrong direction. See, we understand there are going to be new checks and balances about ongoing professional scrutiny in the future, which is a, which is a good thing. But of course, it doesn't apply to all those whose misdemeanours are historic, um, who are being looked at uh, at the moment by the police uh, themselves. So are you convinced that there is sufficient rigour in ongoing professional practice scrutiny for those people who have been with the police historically, as well as those new people coming in who will be subject to higher thresholds of suitability, hopefully? So we're six months into my commissionership. There is a lot more rigour than there was six months ago. I'm sure we'll be increasing it further. OK. We are going to have to conclude at this point. Before you go, um, I just wanted to ask if you would write to the committee about two issues. One is, we've been told that the Met has the worst records for the quality of files passed to the CPS. I think 38 to 40 per cent of files submitted uh, uh, only, sorry, only 38 to 40 per cent reach the, the standard that's expected by the CPS. So do you think you could write to me about what you're doing uh, in terms of sorting out the, the files going to the CPS? The other issue was we were told by the chair of the Independent Scrutiny and Oversight Board that uh, she believes there needs to be more communication and join-up between London's local race action plan 
and the National Police Race Action Plan. So could you write to us about how you're engaging with the National Race Action Plan to ensure that the Met is going to deliver the National Plan and it complements the work of the local London Plan as well? Would that be possible to do that as sure, well? I mean, on the second one, yeah. we are adopting the National Race Action Plan. That is our approach. It hasn't been historically. We changed that um, on my watch. So rather than having our own plan that reflects it gently, we're adopting it fully. OK, I'm, I'm raising the concerns of the Chair that quite recently. So is that a decision you've made in, in recent <coughs> times? Um, in the last two or three months, yes. In the last two or three months? Oh, yeah. OK. All right. OK, well, it, thank you for telling me that, because that's not what the, what the uh, Chair of the Independent Oversight Board told us. But anyway, OK. Can I thank you very much for your time you this morning? Much. And you've had some very robust questioning, uh, but we feel very... We feel this is such an important issue and we're hoping that you'll be able to come back before the committee in the months and years to come to show how the Met is changing. I'd be very keen to do that. And can I finish, make one final yes, comment? Yes, please do. Uh, of course it's important that when a big organisation is failing in many respects that you're robust in your challenge of us. But can I ask you to think about the tens of thousands of men and women who come to come to work to protect London and give up their best day in and day out. And I don't mind how tough you are with me and how robust the language is about the people who shouldn't be in the organisation. But they desperately need your support if they if we're going to succeed. And if we can if we can ensure that's part of the conversation, that would be really helpful. Well, I think that's reflected in the fact the committee has spent the last few months on the inquiry into policing priorities to make sure that the police are actually providing the level of service and focusing on the things that the public want. So please rest assured this committee is very focused on uh, getting the very best out of our uh, police forces and supporting the many, many excellent police officers that we have serving in police forces all around the country. Thank you very and much. And we thank you for your time today. Thank you very thank much. You. We're going to suspend shortly.